Jay Dilla is one of the most legendary hip hop producers of all time. In his 32 years of life, he was able to make multiple classic records, produce hundreds of songs, and redefine how music would be made forever. There have been countless books and documentaries chronicling his life and influence, but I want to focus on one portion of his career. The last 10 years of his life, from 1996 to 2006, may just be the greatest decade that any American musician has ever had. Jay Dilla started making beats as a teenager, and was able to develop a style of producing that would soon have the entire hip hop world clamoring for his beats. His syncopated sequencing is known for humanizing the MPC, and making each of his beats feel alive. His beat tapes from the mid 90s were made from this dust filled curiosity that took what world class producers like Q-Tip and Prince Paul were doing and putting a new age Detroit spin to it. And now for a quick pause in the documentary because I am excited to announce that this video is sponsored by Rapper Cards. Rapper Cards are the hottest hip hop collectibles around with a wide array of cards from legends, mainstream icons, and the best emerging underground talents. I've been collecting them for a few years and even wrote the album descriptions on the back of the blue cards a few years ago. This month, Rapper Cards are releasing a series in collaboration with Jay Dilla's estate in honor of his 50th birthday. Each card features art from local Detroit area artists, and they look incredible. Each of their unique high quality cards is perfect for anyone with a passion in hip hop, and if you're watching my channel, then they'll be perfect for you. And now, back to the video. In 1996, he formed the group Slum Village with his childhood friends T3 and Batin. The group made smooth, funk-confused hip-hop, and their early demos immediately became the hottest around the industry. The early Slum Village demos ended up getting released on their first two records, Fantastic Volumes 1 and 2. These records each have some of the greatest beats that Dilla would ever conjure up. The trio had this basement show live feel to them, giving these early records a classic texture from the jump. People often group Slum Village in with movements like the Native Tongues because of the sample based sound of their music, but Slum Village brought a completely different energy than those groups. The personality on these Slum Village records was driven by sex and partying. This is very evident by the lyrics, but Dilla's beats brought an extra stank to the attitude of the records. They were able to make music as smooth and pleasant sounding as the Native Tongues classics, but do it in a way that was completely their own and true to their city and lifestyle. At this time, Jay Dilla who was known by JD, was not just drawing comparisons to the Native Tongues, but he was also responsible for helping to revitalize the Native Tongues collective itself. Dilla was introduced to Q-Tip after the release of Midnight Marauders, and Tip immediately became a fan of his production style. Q-Tip formed the production group The Uma, along with Ali Shaheed Muhammad and JD. The production on a Tribe Called Quest's next two albums, Beach Rhymes and Life, and The Love Movement, was credited to The Uma but it is widely known that most of the beats on these projects were made by Dilla himself. These albums often get overlooked in lieu of Tribe's other legendary work, but the production is nothing short of incredible. Dilla was able to bring a Detroit edge to the sound of these beats that was simply not there on Tribe's other records. Q-Tip was a huge inspiration for Dilla, so for him to take a backseat and let Dilla affect the sound of the group shows how much trust he had in Jay Dilla as a fellow artist. That same year, De La Soul released Stakes Is High, officially reinstating the native tongue. Jay Dilla produced the title track on the album, and along with his 1995 production for The Far Side, he was not only working with some of the biggest artists in hip hop, but he was actually making them better. I think Dilla gets pigeonholed into being just a lo-fi boom bap producer, but he is so much more than that. In fact, some of his finest work came on some higher profile projects. In 1997, he produced the remix for Janet Jackson's hit single, Got Till It's Gone, and that same year he produced on Busta Rhymes' When Disaster Strikes. JD and Busta Rhymes are a rapper-producer combo that never gets the love they deserve. There's funk and energy within each of Dilla's beats that lends itself perfectly to Busta's ultra-unique approach to MCing. Throughout the first three years of this decade-long run, Dilla produced on all those classics that I've been naming, but he also produced on many other great albums, such as From Where by Mad Skills, Come Fly With Me by The Cats, Gravity by The Bush Babies, and the album that Time Forgot by Five Elements. One thing about becoming a Jay Dilla fan is that you will never run out of beats to hear. He was making so many beats at the time, and from 96 to 98, also had what is now known as the 96 batch, the unreleased EP, and one called Another Batch, which all have now since surfaced around the internet. In 1998, a tribe called Quest broke up, but that did not mean the end of their collaborations with Jay Dilla. In fact, he produced on both Q-Tip and Fife Dog's first solo albums. 
He produced nearly the entirety of Q-Tip's 1999 album, Amplified. This album had much more of a mainstream feel to it than the previous work of both Dilla and Tip, but it worked so well. Dilla was able to make beats that had pop appeal, while still keeping them rooted in his own unique style. Jay Dilla was a main force in creating the Tongue's spiritual successor, the Soulquarians. The Soulquarians consisted of Q-Tip, Erica Badu, Common, D'Angelo, Talib Kweli, Most Def, Quest Love, Jay Dilla, and more of the era's most talented singers, rappers, and producers. The collective was able to make some of the best music of the late 90s and early 2000s, with their like-minded way of viewing the world, music, and their own creativity. The Soulquarian sessions were an open cauldron, where each sound alchemist was able to toss in their own ingredients into each musical concoction, and the result was a synthesis of all the artists' tastes and sounds. In 1999, Dilla produced on the Roots album Things Fall Apart, and the following year he produced a majority of Common's Like Water for Chocolate, two socially conscious hip-hop masterpieces. Common is probably the MC who worked best with Jay Dilla throughout his career. Jay Dilla's production defined Common's Soulquarian era and helped to redefine who Common was as an artist. The duo's chemistry was a perfect fusion of hip-hop and soul. There is a deliberate precision to the way that Common raps. Every word he uses is articulated with purpose, and his breath guides his delivery with this soulful gravity. And Jay Dilla has the same effect with his beats. Even when he's using a non-linear beat pattern, every note in a Jay Dilla song finds its home in the perfect place, and the humanity that he breathes through his beat machine guides each and every track. After Like Water for Chocolate, Jay Dilla produced much of Common's next record, Electric Circus, and Common's 2005 classic, B on that one sharing the production credit with Kanye West, another one of Jay Dilla's production disciples. Through his Soulquarians era, he also produced for Erica Badu, Talib Kweli, Chino XL, more Busta Rhymes, more De La Soul, and many others. Jay Dilla left Slum Village in 2001 to pursue a solo career, but he still provided beats for their next few records. Once he went solo, it gave him an opportunity to showcase his true personality on Wax. His debut single, Fuck the Police, came out in 2001 and brought a brand new energy compared to what people had grown to know as his sound. The track is filled with the energy of an anti-cop rally. The production rings with the vivacity of street sirens, and his rapping performance channels the attitude and power of N.W.A. on the original track with that name. Dilla was rapping on the old Slum Village albums, but now that he was solo, he was able to bring his rapping to the forefront. The praise that he gets as a producer often overshadows the fact that Jay Dilla is a great rapper too. His debut solo album, Welcome to Detroit, mixes beautiful instrumentals, with Dilla spitting an introduction to his world of Detroit. Up to this point, he always went under the name JD, and this album was the first time that the name J Dilla was used, signaling a new era of his career. Conscious rappers often gravitated towards his production style, but that is not what J Dilla brings as an MC. This is an underground party record, built for being the soundtrack to smoking and going to the strip club. In 2003, Jay Dilla teamed up with another production legend, Madlib, and the two formed the duo J-Lib. Madlib and Jay Dilla are widely thought of as two of, if not the two best hip-hop producers ever. On this album, they share rapping and production duties, helping to bring out different sides to each of their sounds. The album was recorded separately, with Madlib recording in California and JD in Detroit. In fact, they only met one time in person before the record even came out, but you can't tell at all. Their chemistry is so strong that they feel like kindred spirits, two parts of the same musical soul. Through these years, with Dilla releasing all these classics, he still kept busy, staying to his true basement beat roots. Dilla mixtapes and CDs were always popping up and circulating at the time, and there was always a new batch on the way. Some of his best from this era was 1999's The New Slave, Volume 1 Unreleased, and Volume 2 Vintage. And he always kept it close to his Detroit roots, producing on Elzai's album Witness My Growth, and the Frank and Dank record 48 Hours. In 2003, he released the Rough Draft EP. The entire project was recorded in under a week, and is one of the most experimental and underappreciated works in his catalog. This record has all of the abstract experimentation of the Soulquarian days, but since it's Jay Dilla working with just himself, he's able to let his true artistic expression shine through. The album had a very lo-fi sound to it when it was originally released, but it was remastered and re-released in 2007. Jay had another solo album that he was planning to release around 2002, called Pay Jay. This record has Dilla rapping over production from Madlib, Hi Tech, Bink, Wajid, Kareem Riggins, Knotts, 
and Super Dave West, making this the only album where he raps over multiple different producers' beats. The album was finally released in 2016, under the name The Diary, and was thought of as the last lost piece of Jay Dilla's incredible discography that the world was waiting for. In 2002, Jay Dilla was diagnosed with lupus and a rare blood disease. A weaker man would have let that stop them, but Jay Dilla still had music in his heart that he needed to share with the world. Donuts was released on February 7, 2006, three days before he passed away. This is not only the greatest instrumental hip-hop album ever made, but it is widely thought of as one of the best albums of all time. It's way more than just a collection of beats, but it's an opus of life, death, and Jay Dilla himself. The album has 31 tracks, and he was 31 years old at the time when he made it. The album begins with the outro, and ends with a track called Welcome to the Show. So the whole thing acts as his life flashing before his eyes, right before he heads up to heaven. And the last track ends with the same sound that starts the album off, forming an infinite loop, just like Donuts, Time, and the incredible life and career of Jay Dilla, that will continue on forever. The decade of Dilla, as I have been calling it, technically would end here, but there was still so much of his music to be heard. During that decade, Dilla was working so hard on making music that there has been dozens of albums released after his death, with more to be heard. The Shining was released just six months after his passing, and that's really just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to his posthumous releases. Jay Dilla was able to give us so much music in such a short time. Most of his career happened within the bounds of one decade. From 1996 to 2006, Jay Dilla had one of the most incredible runs that any artist has ever been on. Within those years, a legacy was made, and hip-hop was changed forever. Rest in peace, Jay Dilla. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. Rest in peace to Jay Dilla, the greatest to ever do it. Thank you so much to Rapper Cards for sponsoring this video. This is my first sponsored video ever, so everybody make sure you go and check Rapper Cards out. Go support them. Rapper Cards are dropping a bunch of Jay Dilla material this month, so make sure to go check them out over at rapper-cards.com or hit them up at rapper underscore cards on Instagram and Twitter. As always, I want to give a special shout out to my patrons. The Patreon has really been picking up lately as I've been doing this monthly podcast where I'm able to talk about so much music and answer questions from all the viewers and all the fans. So if you're interested in any more content from me, you can check it out at patreon.com slash defgoldbloom. And as always, Def Magazine is available at staydef.com. As always, I got a lot more headed your way. So stay tuned, stay safe, and stay deaf. Thanks for watching.